Gatlinburg, Tennessee, a literal mountain town, with nothing but hills and mountains as far as the eyes can see. Our science teacher, Mr. Russo, was our chaperone for the trip. He was a very lax teacher, so while other teacher chaperones were more uptight and strict with their groups, Mr. Russo was more chill about his job. And that may seem like a good thing, but because of his lackadaisical approach at supervising, my friend Ethan and I were able to easily get out from the aquarium lobby, away from the rest of the groups. We quite simply didn't want to wait so long for all the groups to move. The whole aquarium was empty, except for our classes. So when Aiden and I walked through the passageways, or I guess observation areas as you would say, or everyone else, we didn't see anyone else. We got the best views at all the big fish tanks and habitats. We moved on to the next dark room, all of which were lit up with a dark blue tint from the fish tanks, by the way. This room had a lot of big tanks with tropical fish. We were making jokes about finding Nemo fish, like clownfish and the dory fish. And that's when I remember someone calling it hey to us in a very assertive, commanding voice. It was some guy in cargo shorts and a green t-shirt. He asked us if we were with the field trip. I was about to shake my head no, but Eden said yes. The man told us to come with him right now. We both assumed he worked for the aquarium, so we followed. He wasn't leading us back to the lobby, though. He was leading us through some narrow, dark hallways. I remember passing the bathrooms and a few exit signs hanging on the ceiling before reaching an exit door. He led us outside to some back area, I guess by the woods. I finally asked if he worked there and where he was leading us. He said yes, he did work there, and that he had to drive us back around to the front of the aquarium in order to be let back in made just as much sense back then as it does now. But we were two nervous 7th graders who thought we were about to get in serious trouble. So when he led us to his car, he willingly got the back seat. He told us to strap in, and he pulled out from the back parking lot and onto the street. Just as we thought he was going to make a right turn towards the front, he turned left. Right away, both Aiden and I asked him where he was going at the same time. He didn't answer that question. But about five seconds later, we heard the locks to the back doors click down, and he made some kind of threat along the lines of, if either of you try to make any moves, I'll kill you. He then proceeded to slide out what appeared to be a big knife in his glove box as some kind of threat. He and the knife sat in silence. I'm sure he wanted to throw up just like I wanted to. We had to think of a way to escape, but we couldn't talk to each other because the man kept looking in the rearview mirror every other second. He was driving us uphill through some woodsy, isolated neighborhood until he finally pulled over onto the side of the road in what appeared to be the middle of nowhere. No houses, no through traffic. He told us to stay in the car as he got out with his knife in his hand. I whispered to Aiden to be prepared to run as soon as I said so. The man came to my door, popped it open, and told me to step out. He told me to tell my friend that if he wants me alive, he better be in the car by the time we got back. I felt a deepening feeling in my stomach when I heard that. The man started walking me to the woods with the knife probably in his pocket, to do God knows what. I saw Aiden sliding over to my side of the car, which had an unlocked door. And when he seemed ready to run, I screamed, run. Aiden was off already, running downhill. I easily dodged the man as I fled past him, following Aiden. The man tried chasing us on foot, and I'm not even kidding when I say he threw the knife at me. He missed with only maybe a few inches to spare. I heard the clanging of the knife hitting the ground ahead of me. I didn't stop to pick it up. I just kept running downhill in the direction we came. The man stopped following after throwing the knife. I think he got back in his car and fled the scene. We somehow managed to make it back to the aquarium in under an hour. And we also managed to sneak back into the group. Mr. Russo didn't even notice. Aiden and I decided to keep quiet about what just happened. What purpose would it serve getting ourselves in trouble given that there was relatively no chance of that man getting caught? As we got older, we started to wonder more and more what the intentions of that man were. We could obviously think of a few likely ones, but either way, we kept quiet about it and don't really like to think about it.
I was in 8th grade, all of my classmates and I looked forward to our Washington, D.C. field trip. The thrill of going on any sort of trip with your friends was enough to excite us. After all preparations, we were ready for D.C. Once we arrived to our destination, my class of around 100 students were partitioned off into three groups. And within these groups were our three other hotel mates. Each group was sent off in different coach buses. We would be taken to different attractions throughout D.C., neighboring states, monuments, parks, food stops, museums, and more. After a long weekend of visiting educational sites, our teachers decided to treat us to a colonial ghost tour one night. It was an evening walking tour through some of America's historical sites near village cemeteries and old townhomes. I don't remember exactly which city we were in, but I remember the guides telling us that many of the empty homes were preserved due to their historical significance. I've always been scared of most things related to ghosts and such, but I was positive that nothing would happen in our ghost tour. We split off into smaller groups of around 10 members each, and were instructed to carry around a camera if we wished. The guides kept telling us not to expect much from the tour, but there would most likely be nothing supernatural during the course of the evening. As we wandered from colonial home to cemetery plot to colonial home, I just took interest in the histories that the guides would share of each home. They would indulge us in the stories of each homeowner while my friends would snap away at photos, hoping to find a shiny orb. One of my friends, Jessica, that I was sharing a room with during that trip, was not one of the kids that were constantly taking pictures. She would take a photograph every once in a while, but spend most of the time listening. My group reached a small two-story home in the middle of the street. The house had an ominous blue hue to the windows, but the house was vacant. I remember being very curious about this home. The tour guide began to tell us a little bit about the house. She had mentioned that the home had originally belonged to a man and his beautiful wife. He adored his wife, and the couple was thrilled to receive news that they would be expecting a child. Unfortunately, the wife had died after giving birth to a baby girl. The man was absolutely devastated and grew to resent his homely daughter. <coughs> During her childhood, he kept her in the house as much as he could. He reminded her about how homely she looked and could not find her a suitor. And that she had no other purpose, he had his daughter learn how to sew and weave upstairs, using her only good attribute, her hands. After hearing this story, I remember the sorrow that I felt for this girl. She and her father must have lived unhappily in that house until their deaths. My friend Jessica took a photograph of the house, and we both moved on to the next house. I kept walking until Jessica stopped and became silent, looking down in her digital camera. I walked over and scanned the photograph. I saw a gleam coming from the edge of the second floor window on the right. I had her zoom on the scene. After zooming, I could clearly see three figures staring out from the window. On the way right was the transition outline of a woman. A taller man was standing behind her to the side. Even more curiously, there was a third figure that appeared to be a woman, but she was harder to make out. The body was there for sure, but her skin was not as clear. Jessica and I freaked out. The first woman and man made sense to me. That would explain the man and his daughter. But who was this third dark woman off the side? I raised my hand and had to ask the guy, was there ever another person that lived with this family at the house we just looked at? The guy looked surprised at my question and answered, Yeah. During the time of their residence, they had a black female servant living with them. Surreal. 
surrounded by forest in every direction. The only road that leads up to it is a road you would never think to drive down just because of the grass growing in the street. Since our current topic at the time of our class was dealing with drugs, Mr. Stevenson led us into the abandoned building. He gave a tour of the place as if he'd been there many times before, and he seemed to know quite a bit of history about the building. For example, that the actual original purpose of the building was unknown. Apparently construction on the high levels wasn't even finished before the building was abandoned. Its location and size made it ideal for drug deals and other illegal activity to take place. Which surprised all of us since there we were, inside of this apparent former drug den for a school field trip. Mr. Stevenson was so laxed about this trip that he didn't even notice when a couple students wandered off to explore on their own. He just didn't care. Given that a few other students did it, me and my friend Gianna, or G, decided to go off on her own too. And yes, I'm a guy. I just so happened to have a really close friend that was there back in high school. There had to be at least eight floors in the building, and we saw from the outside the top few floors looked unfinished. I basically forced G to come all the way upstairs with me to the top few floors. Worst came to worst, we wouldn't be able to find the group again. We just returned to the bus right outside. We climbed the stairs, one flight after another. As we reached the middle floors, the amount of debris and graffiti lessened a bit, but then as we got to the higher floors, there was even more graffiti and litter than the lower floors. Then things got sketchy. We were on the second highest floor, and everything on this floor was still just wood foundation. A lot of it seemed to be rotting. There were a lot of holes up there. We would have gone up to the last floor, but the stairs had been completely stripped and broken. Basically, there were no stairs to the last floor. There had to be a way up there, though. So we watched our step for weak wood as we navigated the floor. Then, Gianna grabbed my shoulder and stopped me. She pointed up at a hole in the ceiling and said she saw something. Then, there was a ticking noise. Like the kind of ticking noise a person makes when they're calling their cat or something. Followed by that, someone's arm came into view from the hole above us. Just their arm, though. And judging by the position of the arm, Whoever's arm it was must have been laying down flat in the floor beside the hole. They had a long black sleeve on, so the only skin that was visible was their hand. She was scared. I laughed a little at first, but I'm not going to say it was slightly unnerving. Gianna started telling me, let's go back down. I started calling up to the person, how do we get up there? They didn't answer. Instead, they just kept making the ticking noise and waving us up. That's when things started getting really creepy, and I agreed with G that we should go back down. Right after I said this, the person pulled their arm out from the hole, and we heard the sound of a shoe quickly scrape the wood foundation above us, as the person was clearly getting up. We couldn't see, though. I nudged Gianna to move. I was creeped out and just wanted to get back down. As we were about to leave the main open room and back into the stairway corridor, there was a crash far behind us. We turned and saw a man on the complete opposite side of the room, facing the wall. It seemed he just jumped through one of the holes. He then quickly turned his head to look at us, without moving his body. There was something about his face and clothing. He didn't look like the typical urban exploration type. He looked dangerous and unstable. G and I ran for it now, down one flight of stairs at a time. Three flights down, I looked up the long corridor above us and saw the man at top looking down at me. I yelled go to Gianna. We kept going down. Like five flights later, I looked up again and there was the man again looking down at me. This time he seemed much closer and I just realized he'd been chasing us. We got to the bottom and I looked up one more time and I didn't see him this time. We heard the voice of Mr. Stevenson nearby, and I kind of started to laugh about what just happened. Not exactly because I found it funny, but because I was just happy that we made it back safely. She was not laughing at us, she was genuinely disturbed. We found Mr. Stevenson, who asked where we were, and told the truth about what just happened. He was pretty mad at us, but given what we just told him, he also advised we should leave the building. The other kid who wandered off had returned, and when we got to the bus, Mr. Stevenson did a head count like three times. 
overall return was a failure for the rest. The other kids did learn things about the building and drugs, but for my friend Gianna and I, really, it was the most horrific thing we ever went through. Get this window.
clip it. 